from Australia. This is the Wireless Institute of Australia with the weekly news service. This broadcast is in text, audio and video and is accessed on wia.org.au. Alrighty, this is VK4BB. As somebody said recently, VK4 Bad Boy. It is the program recorded in Brisbane Olympic City 2032. The program, the WIA National News Service. Now, you wouldn't necessarily expect a regional town known for its gold mining and agriculture to be the next centre of drone excellence. But this father and son did. The key points are a drone testing range is being established at West Wyalong in the New South Wales Riverina. New drone, balloon and space technology are being developed and it's hoped that the technology will be used by emergency services to help save lives. ABC News are reporting flight design research and development manager Robert Brand and his son Jason are setting up a facility at West Wyalong in New South Wales Riverina to study, develop and analyse aerospace and space hardware. The 70-year-old has high hopes for some of the potentially life-saving hardware. He said it could have been valuable during the black summer bushfires and recent flood emergency in the east of the country. The brand started working on a project to send balloons into the sky that will stabilise at an altitude of about 16 kilometres, something Robert Brand said had rarely been achieved. They'll have solar power, they'll have batteries, they'll be able to just motor gently against the wind up there, which is pretty light, he said. We can fly a system to a disaster zone and provide visuals of what's going on and provide radio communication to people on the ground. We need to be able to get this technology bedded down really well and into the hands of our Defence Force, firefighters and the SES. And if we can do that, it will change this country. At 20, Jason Brand is the CEO of Flight Design. He's also the youngest person to win the Australian Industry and Defence Network Young Achiever New South Wales Award. But... Thanks to an amateur radio club, all this nearly didn't happen. I was nine years old the first time we went on a balloon launch, he said. Long story short, the amateur radio club we knew were going to do one. They said it's too difficult to launch balloons. We're not going to do that. So sad. So I decided we wanted to, and it all started from there. Growing up, school never agreed with Jason. He barely got his higher school certificate. So, again, he took matters into his own hands, literally. I learnt in my own way, and that's through doing, researching on the internet, actually having the objects in my hand and programming them, he said. Well done, those men. And if you're that amateur radio club that couldn't help, thought it was too hard, shame, shame, shame. Now, with Anzac Day fast approaching, here's VK4MIK, Mike Patterson. The AM and CW on Anzac Day event. This event has been operating for many years. It developed after I talked to World War II Coast Watcher Sergeant Lionel Veal, who operated with Allied Intelligence Bureau, which gathered intelligence in New Guinea to allow further operations using his RCA ATR4 Alpha. They used radio to pass coded messages back to the base stations. It reminded me that radio communications have played a lot, such a big part in Australia's defence history from World War I to the present. Following that, it occurred that there was quite a large number of folk in amateur radio who served in the armed forces, and it would be appropriate to have a radio salute to those who served and are still serving and use the old radio modes of AM and CW that was used during World War I and II and even Korea. We also encourage use of ex-Defence Force radios and older radios as history showed that there were many occasions where commercial radio receivers were used. Plus, I personally had experienced many commercial radios used when I served in the RAN Hydrographic Service. The Tableland Radio Group gave me support for the initiative. The Townsville Amateur Radio Club has supported the event since the beginning and the radio operator experience of the Gavin VK4ZZ XOTCRO as net control has proved invaluable as Townsville Radio Club also operates from the World War II Command Bunker which is the SES headquarters in Townsville. The event has grown in popularity over the years and amateurs get to experience AM for the day and for many that is a new experience. But it is interesting how well the AM transmissions travel. We also encourage operations from former defence facilities if possible. 
this year the Wyala Amateur Radio Club are hoping to operate from near the ex-HMAS Wyala, one of only two surviving corvettes from the 60 that was built in Australia during World War II. Andrew VK5CW and others will be operating from the Repatriation General Hospital site, Australian Military Hospital 105, in its 80th year. Doc VK5BUG will be operating CW from around 7.018 during the afternoon. He is XRAN, NATO and a Marconi School of Radio trained. Some members of the Australian military radio operators will be operational as well using a variety of military radios over the weekend. Suggested frequencies are 7.125 7.125 for AM and 7.025 CW. This event is not a contest and is designed to be friendly and social and allow amateurs to try the old radio modes, lest we forget. VK1 WIA. The WIA Hybrid AGM and Virtual Conference 2022 has the theme of Antarctic Gateway and is open for registrations. It takes place on Saturday, May the 7th, with the AGM kicking off at 10.30 AEDT and the Virtual Conference starting at 1300 AEDT. The Virtual Conference consists of four special presentations that highlight the history, culture, research and communications associated with Antarctica. This week we focus on the first two presentations and next week the last two. Our keynote speaker is Professor Ellie Leanne from UTAS and is titled Mixed Signals, the Impact of Wireless on the Australasian Antarctic Expedition 1911-14. to Just before the Australasian Antarctic Expedition departed in late 1911, its leader Douglas Mawson boasted to the media that the great feature of the expedition is our wireless equipment. For Mawson, establishing wireless communication between the two continents for the first time was important not only for practical and scientific reasons, but also symbolic ones. A continent that was effectively within talking distance of Australia, he argued, had a special call upon its people. The presentation draws on a collaborative research project with polar historian Ben Madison and psychologist Kimberly Norris and examines the impact of the wireless on the interpersonal dynamics of the expedition, focusing particularly on Sidney Jeffries as a way of understanding the important but destabilising role this technology played during Australia's first Antarctic expedition. The second presentation is by well-known microwave experimenter Rex Moncur, VK7MO, who between 1988 and 1999 was director of the Australian Antarctic Division, the AAD. This is a unique look at the management of Australia's Antarctic Territory, radio communications covering historic connections, amateur links to Heard Island, and the installation of the Inari-Sat satellite system. Rex will cover his passion for Earth-Moon-Earth contacts, and specifically with Macquarie Island, and the challenges of rebuilding, funding and shipping to and from Antarctica. Rex managed the AOD at a time when our political leaders made for some challenging times, when the Madrid Protocol on the Protection of the Antarctic Environment was being negotiated, and this led to the AOD's focus on climate change and the establishment of the Antarctic Cooperative Research Centre at the University of Tasmania. Rex finishes off with some interesting and very expensive examples of Murphy's Law from his time at the division. Now, how do you participate? If you're coming along in person to the AGM, then please book at the link on the text edition of the broadcast. If you wish to receive the stream of the AGM and Open Forum, then a Memnet email will be sent to all WIA members in the very near future and will enable you to register and receive the stream details. To register to attend in person or receive the stream of the virtual conference presentations, then please register at the link, and this is a different link to the AGM link, on the text edition of this broadcast. 
There is a small charge of $10 to cover organisational costs for the virtual conference presentations. And for further details, please check out the WIA website and Facebook pages. On behalf of the 2022 Conference Organising Committee, we look forward to seeing you on the stream on May the 7th. This 73 from yours truly, Justin, VK7 Tango Whiskey, for the WIA National News. This is the home service of the Wireless Institute of Australia through VK1 WIA. Now, international news with Jason, VK2 LAW. Hello. Leading international news from Region 1, ARU Monitoring System Region 1 newsletter reports during March, likely as a consequence of the current military situation, they noticed an increase of transmissions in unknown modes in HF amateur radio bands. In many cases, their most probable function was to act as jammers in order to disrupt or nullify their reception. They also received on several occasions a signal whose possible function Given its behaviour, transmission of short but powerful bursts jumping in an organised and repetitive way along the radio spectrum could be to act as an ionosond. Radar used to examine the ionosphere in order to determine the optimum frequency for the transmission of signals in HF bands. Also, military modes that IARUMS had not observed for a long time, such as the Russian digital mode T-231A, also known as Mahovic, were copied. IARU Region 1 respond to EC Solar Energy Strategy. In their response to the European Commission Solar Energy Strategy, IARU Region 1 have highlighted the level of RF pollution that can be caused by the solar PV optimizers used in solar panel installations. A post on the IARU Region 1 site says, IARU Region 1 PRC in conjunction with the region's EMC committee has submitted a paper to a recent European Commission call for evidence with respect to solar energy strategy. Solar energy systems, which include solar PV, are a progressive technology whose use is to be encouraged. However, there are certain caveats to be noted in deployment and ongoing use. IARU concerns are not with solar technology per se, but with the potential pollution from so-called optimizers. The paper that was submitted detailed elements of the ongoing research and monitoring by the EMC committee in this area. Celebrating the centenary of the transatlantic tests, the RSGB in Region 1 has released a video celebrating the centenary of the 1921 transatlantic tests. The Radio Society of Great Britain and the ARRL have been celebrating the centenary of the transatlantic tests. This video highlights the fantastic exhibition put on by the National Heritage Centre in Saltcoats. The 1921 message reenactment by the Kilmarnock and Loudoun Amateur Radio Club and the 160 metre transatlantic QSO party. In news from Region 2, Canada. Updated policy on amateur radio and examinations. Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada, ISED, have released updated versions of two important amateur radio policy documents for that country's hands. They are RIC1, Guide for Examiners Accredited to Conduct Examinations for Amateur Radio Operator Certificates, RIC3, Information on the Amateur Radio Service. Both documents were updated to reflect the changes made to the radio communication regulations, specifically the rescinded ISED $20 examination fee for amateur radio operator certificates and the removal of certificates that are no longer issued by ISED. Other revisions include editorial corrections for clarity and the conversion to electronic format of the form to apply to become an accredited examiner. Amateur Radio in Canada became licence exempt on April 1, 2000. A call sign when issued lasts for 125 years from the holder's date of birth, at which point it can be reassigned. For VK1 WIA National News in Sydney, I'm Jason VK2LAW. Now operational news with Felix VK4FUQ. Hello there. Now, contest-wise, 2022. 
Her Angel Memorial 80 metre sprint, Saturday, May 7, 2022. 10 hours UTC to 11.46 UTC. The Don Edwards Memorial Slow Morse Contest two days starting May 14, 1800 hours. Concluding May 15, 1600 hours. Saturday evening 14 May between 6pm and 9pm Eastern Standard Time, 180 metres. Sunday afternoon 15 May between 1pm and 4pm Eastern Standard Time, 140 metres. International CQ Pride Contest June 4 to 6. New Worldwide Digital Contest also June 4 to 6. VK Shires Contest 11 June. WIA VHF UHF Winter Field Day. Winter 2022. 0200 hours UDC Saturday 25 June. Through 0159 hours UDC Sunday 26 June. Dippers in BK6. IARU HF World Championship next contest is July 9 and 10. WIA Trans Tasman Low Beam Contest 16 July 2022. The Trans Tasman Contest held on the third weekend in July and aims to encourage low beam activity between VK and ZL. RSGB IOTA Contest is July 30 31. WIA RD or Remembrance State Contest weekend closest to the 15th of August each year. 2022 is Saturday, Sunday, August 13 and 14. DX Window In the Maldives, active for a few more days is 8Q7DX through to the 27th of April on 80 through 10 metres. QSL for LATW and E73Y Lithuania, LY Special call sign LY100BBALL is QRV until the end of April to commemorate 100 years of basketball there. QSL via LY2QT. Kenny will be on the air from Otso Island, AS117. From April 30 to May 1st on 40, 20, 17 and 6 metres, where Kenny will be using CW, SSB and FT8. QSL via the home call, JA4GXS. Listen for the call sign 3Z80AK through May 31st. Polish amateurs are marking the 80th anniversary of the formation of the Home Army, which was the dominant underground resistance movement in Poland during World War II. QSL via SP1 PBW. In the world of DX, be listening on the HF bands for 8N 650JP. The special call sign being used by the Japan Amateur Radio League's Okinawa branch. Hems are marking the 50th anniversary of the return of the Okinawa Prefecture to Japan from the United States Administration. The call sign 8N 650JP is active through the 30th of September. QSOs will be confirmed automatically through the Bureau. Jan Mayen, JX. Helge, LB4MI's QRV as JX stroke. LB4MI until early October. Activities in his spare time on 20 and 17 metres using SSB. QSL to home call LB4MI. For VK1WIA National News, I'm Felix VK4FQQ Inningham. This is the home service of the Wireless Institute of Australia through VK1WIA. Now, special interest group news with Cole, VK3GTV. Hello, welcome to the segment. First up, it's worldwide special interest group news, summits on the air, worldwide flora and fauna program, parks on the air and other adventure groups. Pubs, clubs on the air, 2022. Now, we're pretty sure this is legit and not an old April 1st post, but this must rank as some adventure. It's back. Pubs, Clubs on the Air, May 13th, 14th and 15th. If you or your radio club or society is interested in taking part and putting on a station, please put on your big boots and complete the web entry form at the website listed in the text edition of this news or alternatively email PACOTA, that's P-A-C-O-T-A, at g6tw.org.uk and it's said that they'll send you some details, hints and tips. Worldwide Special Interest Groups, Astronomical, Software Project to Guide World's Largest Radio Telescope. As stories go, this one is up there with the biggest. The World's Largest Radio Telescope, an array of antennas and dishes that spans the hemispheres, is getting software to help in its operation. 
A bit of Radio Newsline's Jeremy Boot, G4NJH, picks up the developments from here. Prototype software for the world's biggest radio telescope will be built by a group of universities and labs in the UK, with money just released by the UK Government Science and Technology Facilities Council, the STFC. The software for the Square Kilometre Array, or SKA, will direct the telescope's gaze at the sky, translate its signals into data, and diagnose issues. BBC News reported that on Monday the 11th of April, the Council had released £15 million, the equivalent of more than $19.5 million in U.S. currency for the work that will involve teams at Oxford, Cambridge and Manchester universities, as well as those at the STFC's own labs in Edinburgh, Daresbury and Harwell. The SKA is an array of 197 dishes and 130,000 antennas in both Australia and South Africa, and the software will allow astronomers to interpret what is received by the SKA at an intensely high resolution, and it is a most sensitive radio signal receiving device. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jeremy Boot, G4NJH. Thanks, Jeremy. Worldwide Special Interest Groups, Final Frontier, URISAT, Hades B ITU designation, is a 1.5p pocket cube mission sponsored by AMSAT EA, offering licensed radio amateurs around the world the opportunity to relay FM voice and AX.25, APRS 300-1200 BPS communications. The slow scan TV camera module is expected to fly, depending on restrictions. Images would be taken randomly, but the SSTV module would also contain some ROM-coded images to be transmitted as well. The launch is planned for a 525-kilometre polar orbit with SpaceX in October this year. For more info, check out amsats-ea.org. More news on CubeSats, LightCube. LightCube is a 1U CubeSat educational mission aimed to inspire and provide a learning experience to people across the planet by producing a light visible to the naked eye. The flash, expected to be as bright as the International Space Station, will be produced by two xenon flash tubes. These will be triggered by amateur radio operators. A downlink on 437.175 MHz using 1K2 AFSK with AX25 has been coordinated with the deployment from the ISS planned for October. More information is available by checking out lightcube.space. Worldwide Special Interest Group's IOTA, EU114. Bob will be active as MU5E from Guernsey during the RSGB IOTA contest from July 30 to 31st as a single operator CW mode entry. QSL Bob via MU5E via LOTW or GU4YOX direct or by the Bureau. EU122 Ian G3WVG will be active as MN5A from Rathlin Island, Northern Ireland during IOTA contest, also as a single operator mixed mode D expedition entry. QSL via LOTW. EU129 Operators Norbert, Rainer, Heiko, George, Ron and Olaf will be active as DK1A from Usedom Island using the RSGB IOTA contest July 30-31st as Multi-2 entry QSL via DK1A direct by the Bureau or Club Logs OQRS. Now with the latest Worldwide Special Interest Groups, Yota Youth on the Air News, it's over to Alec, VK2APC. Youth Preparedness Award for Clovis High School Students. Thanks, Cole. And in this story, we hear how TV station Fox 34, KCBD, reported that the Emergency Management Director, Dan Heating, KG5, DTV, and the Clovis High School Teen Community Emergency Response Team have been awarded the FEMA Region 6 Youth Preparedness Award. FEMA in the U.S. is their Federal Emergency Management Agency. This award is for the program's impact on the school as well as the surrounding community. Dan KG5 DTV has taken an active role in raising Curry County's next generation of leaders and responders by setting a high bar for teen SERP members. In addition to their regular studies and SERP basic training, Clovis High School teen SERP members must complete several FEMA training courses on the National Response Framework 
the National Incident Management System, and the Incident Command System. Team members are encouraged to obtain their technician amateur radio license. They have participated in multiple responder training and have been deployed to three major community events. For VK1, WIA National News, I'm Alec, VK2, APC in Sydney. Now back over to you, Cole. Thanks, Alec. Now on to Worldwide Special Interest Group's Rescue Radio. Amateur radio helps rescue injured California outdoorsmen. A relaxing weekend of camping and fishing did not go as planned when a member of a Californian outdoors club fell and broke his hip. The Old Goats Mountain Club, OGMC, had worked their way along an old forest service road into a rugged off-grid location in the foothills of the Cascade Mountains. Dave Johnson, KL7DJ, said his friend slipped and fell while trying to reel in a catch. The injury was so severe that the man could not be moved safely with a trip that would take at least two hours over the rough terrain. Johnson is the only licensed amateur radio operator in the group, and using California Amateur Linking Radio Association system, he was able to call for emergency help from his vehicle. Greg Stamback, KD6VEN, located in the San Francisco Bay Area, responded and contacted the Shasta County EMS, which dispatched a Reach 5 rescue helicopter from their base in Redding, California. The entire rescue took about one hour, and before the helicopter landed, a local ambulance company arrived and was able to stabilise the injured camper. After surgery and three days in the hospital, he's now at home recovering. Dave's wife Linda, also a licensed TAM, KL7ISN, helped coordinate getting their friend's vehicle back to Reading. Using pre-planned contact schedules and after several makeshift auto patches, the car was driven to a nearby highway where two other club members were able to take the car safely back home. And that wraps up Worldwide Special Interest Group news for this week. I'll catch you next week with more. I'm Col, VK3GTV. Just one more week until the largest gathering of radio amateurs in the Southern Hemisphere gets underway again, as it has done for over 60 years. Mayhem Gates will open for general entry at 8.30am on May 1st. The CCARC Mayhem at Wyong Racecourse is building up to be one of the best yet. Whether you're coming to buy, to learn, to take your licence exam, or simply to meet people you haven't seen for all too a long a time, and are looking forward to the reunion, the CCARC team have got you covered. Fox hunts with prizes both in the car and on foot, car boot sales and commercial traders, exhibitors and lecturers and good old-fashioned meeting up with mates with refreshments. It's all going to be at Wyong. The one thing we can't control is the weather, but as many as the attractions are under cover, that's less of a problem. We do hope to put on a portable radio demonstration with HF and satellite communications as long as the weather is kind to us. To speed your entry, you may wish to buy your tickets in advance online. That facility, along with the list of raffle prizes, traders attending and terms and conditions, can be found on the website at mayham.org.au There is allocated parking for the disabled and Mayhem is a wheelchair-friendly event. If you are travelling to Wyong from further away, don't forget the meet and greet on Saturday evening from half past six in the Grand Hotel in Wyong, on the main road just across the railway from the racecourse. The CCARC look forward to seeing you at Wyong. For the Central Coast Amateur Radio Club, I'm Ed Durant, VK2JI. 60 years, that sure is some record there, Ed. Okay, still to come, May 7, it's the WIA AGM, the virtual event. Hello, this is Greg, VK2GVK. May 7 is fast approaching. It is the date of both the WIA annual general meeting and open forum and the first WIA virtual conference. Both events will be held on location in Hobart and will be live streamed. The WIA AGM will be a hybrid AGM with participation via Zoom and or on-site in Hobart. At the conference, the keynote speaker is Professor Elizabeth Lean from the University of Tasmania with a presentation on Sydney Jeffries and the role played by wireless in the Australasian Antarctic Expedition, plus many other speakers. The AGM and WI Open Forum will also be live streamed on YouTube. For more details on how to attend either in person or virtually and the registration process, please visit the WIO website. 
This is Greg, VK2, GPK. So now until next we meet, I'm Graham, VK4, bad boy. Walk softly. From Australia, this has been the Wireless Institute of Australia with the weekly news service. This broadcast is in text, audio and video and is accessed on wia.org.au. Get us here, Bevan, VK5, BD's ATV and YouTube channel. This has been WIA National News. We're back now, live and local, and your voice, your callbacks. And don't forget, tick like.